Well, America's political part partisanship could cost the nation its AAA credit rating. Fitch Ratings placing the country on ratings watch negative, signaling it could downgrade if lawmakers are unable to raise the debt limit. While Fitch says it expects a resolution to be reached before the X date, lawmakers' failure to, quote, meaningfully tackle fiscal challenges signals risks to U.S. Creditworthiness. In 2011, S&P gave its first ever credit downgrade to the U.S. Remember, it cut its rating to AA plus. It sent Treasury yields down. More than a decade later, that agency still has not restored its ratings. Here to dive in deeper is Andrew Desiderio, a Punchbowl News senior congressional reporter. Thank you so much for being here, Andrew. Um, so, what's the latest here, first of all, on the back and forth and, and what we know? Well, I can tell you they made serious progress uh, late in the day yesterday and overnight. Um, the goal now is to have legislative text uh, sometime over the weekend so that House members can be notified of what McCarthy has called his 72-hour rule, whereby uh, members have 72 hours to review legislation before it's put on the floor for a vote. Um, there are still lots of issues to be resolved, and today is going to be really important for that. Um, but spending levels, uh, you know, seem they seem to be very close on that. Um, they're very close on energy permitting as well. Um, and they almost bas basically have an agreement in principle right now on uh, clawing back uh, unused COVID relief funds. Right. And Andrew, Diane here. So the COVID relief funds have been kind of the low hanging fruit or seen as the low hanging fruit. Uh, and it's something that Democrats would have seemed to be recently willing to concede. But one of the sticking points has been this work requirement uh, aspect that uh, House Speaker McCarthy has been calling for concessions on. What are you hearing on where things stand in nego negotiations on that? sticking point. Yeah, that, that that remains the biggest hang up right now. Um, it's really hard for the two parties to find sort of a, a compromise position on this, because um, with spending, you could just adjust the numbers, right? With work requirements, it's either you have them or you don't, and you figure out sort of the extent to which they're implemented, um, who they apply to, things like that. So it's a much harder issue to tackle. Um, and the White House is very concerned about this issue because you know, frankly, there are a lot of progressives in Congress who are not going to vote for any agreement. They've already said they're not going to vote for any agreement, rather. Um, that includes new work requirements for social safety net programs. So that's going to be a big challenge for the White House as they try to figure out what can actually get the requisite number of votes among the Senate and House Democratic caucuses. Um, Andrew, I've been thinking a lot about this debt ceiling thing because we've been thinking a lot about it or talking a lot about it here. And obviously, we've had this discussion so many times before. And the closer it gets, the more irritated I get. <laughs> and, I, and, and I imagine, like, that's true of people in Washington. I imagine that's true of, the, you know, the public market participants. I imagine that's true of Americans. Like, it's just so dumb. The whole thing. I mean, I, and I, I'm just curious, like, do people inside Washington see it that way? Because the spending cuts that they're quibbling over are really marginal here for the overall size of the debt, if they're really serious about the debt. And like, why not divorce this from holding our debt rating hostage? It just, I, I'm just curious, like inside the Beltway, if the view is, is the same as it is outside. Well, it's certainly the same for those of us who have spent ungodly number of hours taking out Speaker McCarthy's office <laughs> as these negotiators have come in and out and trying to get any morsel of information as we can. Um, but I think, you know, the, the root of this is that, you know, Republicans control the House. They see the debt ceiling as a huge leverage point for them in a divided government. And frankly, it is, you know, the debt ceiling is something that has to be raised um, no matter what. And if Republicans come to the table with a series of demands, um, it's up to the White House and congressional Democrats to sort of work with them and see if they can get a compromise, which is why they spent months saying, look, there should be no hostage taking, no brinksmanship surrounding the debt ceiling. We should just pass a clean debt ceiling bill. Um, and get this over with and not, you know, sort of scare the financial markets, scare the, the global markets, scare our creditors, things like that. Um, but of course, you know, uh, politics rules all here in Washington and Republicans see this as a very important leverage point for them. And it's it's frankly um, one of, if not the, the chief reason that Speaker McCarthy uh, won the speakership but, in the first place. But it's leverage for getting nothing. Like, is what they're going to win in this so important like it it just seems like this the stakes are very high and the roi to talk in wall street terms 
is pretty darn low. Yeah, look, I mean, especially if that's especially the case, if these spending cuts are quite modest, right? And and you're going to have these hardliners who put McCarthy in the speakership in the first place um, and not end up voting for whatever bipartisan product comes of it anyway, right? Um, the thinking is you're not going to get the far left and you're not going to get the far right to vote for this. Um, so you're going to get the reasonable center of both parties to get this over the finish line, get 218 votes in the House, 60 votes in the Senate. So to your point, it's like, you know, the, the people who are holding this up in the first place aren't going to be voting for the final product uh, in the end anyway. Right. Um, so that's that's a lot of the time how these things work in Washington. Uh, Andrew, to your point about uh, scaring the markets, that has happened more, I noticed, in kind of the previous cycle, especially when we had the unprecedented event of the U.S. credit rating being downgraded. Now, there is the threat of that, again, this time coming from Fitch. Let's hone in on this timeline, June 1 being the X date, but there's still time needed to vote. Is there a way that the timeline, especially particularly the voting timeline for lawmakers, can be accelerated? Like, let's say the deal runs right up to nearly upon X day, uh, can the timeline for voting be accelerated? Well, the 72-hour rule is something that McCarthy has said he's going to stick to, right? This is the idea that once legislation is released, the House will not vote on it until 72 hours after that, right? The House can usually process legislation in one single legislative day. Um, the problem really is the Senate, where it takes unanimous consent uh, by all 100 senators to speed up the process and really make things happen. Um, without unanimous consent in the Senate, um, you could see this take four or five, maybe even six days, uh, legislative days, that is. Um, so Chuck Schumer's going to have a really tough job if he wants to try to uh, get this over the finish line uh, as, as close to the X date as possible. Um, it, it seems very, very unlikely, if not impossible to me, that both chambers pass a bill by June 1st, uh, just given the current timeline, the current constraints, as well as the rules of both chambers, particularly in the Senate, where it's a lot harder to pass a piece of legislation than it is in the House. Uh, yeah, exactly. And to your point about running up on that date, we've done that before. And then there are problems that even when you do reach a deal later, there are problems. There's a ripple effect of problems that occur, like certain payments that have to be made, et cetera. But we're going to have to put a bookmark in our conversation for now. We still have days to continue this. So <laughs> we do really appreciate you, Andrew Desiderio, Punchbowl News senior congressional reporter. Our thanks to you.